this webinar then. So uh, for those of you who arrived um, after my initial introduction, so welcome to Atha Insights uh, Relearn program webinar on solar energy in Japan. So today uh, we'll have two experts, Ken Jiraki and Martin Mesmer, tell us uh, all of the, um, you know, the, the details of the developments of solar energy in Japan. So, um, you know, do, um, as I said, you know, you can uh, please tell us where you're joining us from. So we're here from Madrid and so far, you know, in the audience, I can see people from all over the world, from Australia, China, Singapore, Scotland, Spain, and uh, India as well. And, um, and right, to start with, um, our presenters will briefly introduce themselves. Uh, so, uh, Kenji, could you uh, introduce yourself very briefly? Okay, very briefly. My pleasure. Yeah. Kenji Araki, uh, I'm working for Toyota Technological Institute, and I'm the uh, convener of the WD7 of IEC, covering our CVV and unconventional PV and track car. Thank you. Thank you, Kenji. And Martin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Right. My name is Martin Mesmer. I have been in Japan off and on for about nine years altogether. And uh, I've been in the solar industry for roughly 25 years. Um, my uh, customers include power plant developers uh, mainly. So I am responsible for the design of large systems um, and dabbling in other technologies. Great. Thank you, Martin. So, um, well, you'll be the, the first to present today. So if you can share your, your screen. And, um, you know, for those of you uh, in the audience, I'd like to remind you that at the bottom of the screen on your toolbar, you have a Q&A box and you can send your questions uh, to our panelists and they will be answered uh, towards the, the end of the webinar. So after the two presentations. So, you know, I encourage you to ask questions and, and interact with uh, all participants. So, um, Martin, over, over to you. Yes. All right. So, um, up front, a small um, note or a disclaimer. Um, I'm not going to say that everything I say is uh, not to be used as investment advice because I'm not really saying much that can be used for investment. But... Um, mainly, I like talking to the slides, and the information is more in what I say, not in what is uh, printed. So I put that note in here because when I send out these slides, slides tend to have a life of their own so that people realize that when I present graph like, graphs like these, that uh, there has to be some uh, verbiage that goes with them. So uh, if we look at, um, let, let me start, start talking about uh, Japan and its history and context with uh, feed-in tariffs globally. When you look at a typical market development um, in a feed-in tariff market, um, the, the United States is a little bit special with their tax incentive program, um, but uh, Germany and most of the European countries started with feed-in tariffs. Um, what you see is a uh, jumping on the bandwagon or lots of people jumping into it very quickly um, while the incentives are high and um, somewhere along the line, um, utilities realizing that, um, they've, or governments realizing that they may have to pay for this at some point, they may not know how. Spain was a wonderful example on, of how not to do it, um, if, for those of you who remember that. And then as the market matures, we see um, an o and market uh, appear and um, commercial and industrial uh, uh, markets tend to be a little bit slower while the residential has a little bit less, even less of a, um, uh, a hype cycle. So how does, what are, what are the steps that we see in, in these, um, uh, in this development typically are you have subsidies are implemented because the government realizes, gee, we have to do something. In the case of Japan, there was the first wave of PV in the, in the early 90s, 1993. Um, it was the first time I came to Japan, and uh, it was the end of a um, subsidy cycle back then, focused on uh, privately owned rooftop. And then uh, an over oversubscription of the feed-in tariff 
um, quickly causes a strong reduction. And in the um, case of Spain, even a retroactive reduction, <laughs> which was then um, later uh, kind of backfired on the government. And then uh, the, the construction um, continues while the development is already going down. Um, some of the developers that have developed large scale systems uh, then move over to CNI. So this white curve is for mega solar as they call it in Japan or uh, utility scale uh, PV power plants. So these are typical um, tendencies I've seen globally and I've, I've followed markets in the US, Germany and a couple of European countries as well as Japan. Recently I'm also quite interested in um, India as well as um, uh, other Asian countries. So um, where are these countries in the development curve? If you look at Germany and Spain, they're kind of at the end of the cycle. Uh, Japan is going towards the end. Now, mind you, this white curve is um, development, not construction. Uh, there is a difference because there is usually a two to three year delay, uh, sometimes even longer. Um, in the, uh, the US is um, still going strong and it's a, uh, a, a little bit of a different picture and I don't think it will end this way. I don't think they're going to follow this pattern. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think the future of countries who are entering this, this PV market now with subsidies is in the same pattern going forward. Korea is at the beginning of it, um, and they have some really interesting uh, schemes there for uh, veranda modules where people put up two or three modules on their balcony. Okay, so uh, what the cycle, if you look at the cycles that the different countries went through in a, a on a timeline, we're seeing um, Spain uh, here. These are not necessarily in the right size. Um, I, I've tried to do a quick uh, analysis here. Um, Japan was rather late in the cycle. And uh, what surprised me with Japan was how high the prices were here, both for the feed and turf as well as for the construction cost, even though they were so late in the game. Um, but uh, if, you, if you put the different countries in, in, in comparison to each other, Italy is here in green, UK in blue. Um, there's been this, this up and down uh, cycle and, and history repeated itself, but it's changing. So uh, a couple of things are happening. First, the development cycle as it goes down is then followed by the EPC cycle. Currently in Japan, I would say we're at the peak of the EPC or maybe last year we were. In other words, um, while we are no longer at the 11 gigawatts per year being developed and registered, um, that, that's now down to some four or five or maybe six um, gigawatts per year. Uh, the EPCs are still building quite a bit this year uh, because, there's, because of the delay that I mentioned between uh, development time and actual building of the, of the uh, site. And what's also happening is if you see the edge of the curve, we're, we're seeing um, a rebound of the market in the future. So I'm predicting that uh, Japan will find its way uh, as other countries will and will come back to some form of uh, market that is not subsidized and uh, PV has, has come down in price and batteries are coming down in price so that the permeation of PV um, is enabled by batteries without subsidies in the near future and that's what's that's going to be the main driver. I think the IPCC an announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago that we are in trouble as far as the global um, climate is concerned uh, has, it will have some impact on this curve as well. <clears throat> so if we look at uh, the feeding tariff in Japan specifically, um, we see that in 2011 it was implemented because, of, or in, in, in 2011 we had the uh, Fukushima incident. 2012, the government uh, decided, okay, we need to diversify. We have um, whatever, 30 or 40% of the energy came from, um, I think it was 30% from the nuclear power and all those were shut down and it, it caused a very uh, strong drought of energy in this country where even the subways had to shut off half of their lights inside the, the subway train. Um, lots of interesting um, uh, effects from that. We're now starting to see some of, the, some of, uh, see some of these uh, power plants come back on, by the way. Um, Kyushu specifically uh, has just announced or has just opened in the last few um, weeks, months, uh, a couple of uh, nuclear power plants, four gigawatts, came back online. And ta-da, we have the first curtailment of PV in Kyushu, um, which has an impact on finance. I'll get back to that in a minute. 
So then after uh, PV soars, um, utilities start to complain, uh, specifically in places where there is uh, little population. Um, and islands that are restricted, and you cannot uh, distribute the, the uh, uh, intermittent power uh, that you get um, quite well. So in, in Hokkaido, if you want to build today, you have to build with storage. Uh, you can't build a PV power plant on its own. Uh, Kyushu, pretty much the same thing. It's recommended that you do that because you're going to get curtailed, and maybe with storage you can avoid it. But Okinawa, um, without storage, you're, you're not likely to get um, accepted by the, the um, uh, utility. And, and Kyushu has been playing games for the last couple of years, too. So um, then what happened recently was METI, which is the Ministry of Energy, Trade and Industry, the Ministry of Energy, Trade and Industry, um, they adjust the, the feed-in tariff according to, as, as a reaction to what happened. Um, but they're also slapping Kyushu on their fingers, um, Kyushu Electric or other um, uh, utility companies for playing games. They're, they're saying, well, um, you can't just prevent new PV from coming online based on a potential pipeline of projects that may happen in the future. Um, while they're at the same time, they're also telling the developers, look guys, uh, if you have a project that is not happening, kill it, it's gone. You're not getting that feed-in tariff for, forever. Um, because some developers played games. They said, okay, I'm just going to register for a great fit, feed it tariff, and then I'll never build. I'll build in 10 years, and then they have a, a, a great profit margin because it's going to cost me next to nothing to build the, uh, the power plant. And the government here wised up to that and is basically shutting down or um, uh, taking off the books some of these um, uh, feed-in tariffs. They're, they're um, uh, undoing some of those registrations. So that's the feed-in tariff uh, adjustment mentioned here. And this is, this is actually a positive uh, move, I think, because they're preventing the games. And um, if, you, if you know, um, I'm going to take a sidestep here and uh, digress just a little. If you look at history, many uh, technologies come from economics that were uh, put in place by policy. And I can mention several industries where policy has driven economics, which um, drives technology. If you look at technology uh, prevalent in Japan, um, on PV or globally, uh, there has always been an impact by the environment. So in Japan, we have earthquakes, we have snow load, we have um, typhoons, um, and we have hot and muggy air, and we don't have any flat land. So those are all factors that contribute to the design of power plants. Um, there's one policy that has a big impact on design that is building code. Um, and it's not just the policy itself, but it's actually the uh, professional engineer we call it in the US or in, in Japan, it's called the, uh, the CEE, the Certified Electrical Engineer. You have to have one for the larger power plants and he has some power. If he says, I don't like the technology, you're not gonna get it through. So it depends on location. So they have an impact on what you design. Um, they are in part the reason, not only, but in part they are the reason why we don't see many aluminum cables between the combiner box and the inverters, which we see all over the world, except for two countries, one of them is Japan, we just stay with copper because the engineer might be uncomfortable with it. I looked at the code and I argued with an EPC about the code in Japanese, mind you, um, because they had misinterpreted the, misinterpreted the electric uh, code called Dengi, or one of the electric codes here. Um, so you can actually use uh, aluminum, and one Spanish EPC has done that. Um, but some EPCs are adamant about the fact that you, they think that you cannot use uh, aluminum wire. So that's just one example of how um, uh, code has impacted uh, technology. But usually what we're seeing recently is that technology is impacting uh, economics. If you look at the... Um, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading and other DERs, distributed energy generation, et cetera. If you look at those, you, you see that technology is actually now impacting um, uh, policy indirectly, where policy makers are trying to catch up with what's going on um, in the market. So um, to close this topic, um, in, in Japan, we're seeing uh, hilly terrains, typhoons, and, and natural disasters impact design. Uh, racking, the, the code for racking just got a little bit tougher in the last year uh, because um, 
there have been many accidents in smaller power plants, which were not uh, controlled as much as the larger ones. And then you saw panels flying through the air and, and, and racking getting ripped out of the ground when a typhoon came. So the government said, okay, we're going to make the rules a bit stricter. And especially on the outside perimeter of the, of the power plant, you're going to have to have stronger uh, racking systems. Um, so those are some of the uh, effects of the environment um, through code into, um, into uh, uh, the hardware. One, another change that we're seeing is because of curtailment, uh, we're seeing um, inverters now all have an extra uh, PC, the large ones, uh, some extra circuitry comes along with the inverter into your system. And all smaller uh, inverters have to be equipped with the ability to talk through the internet and be curtailed remotely because the, the utilities were asking for that. And this is a big financial problem because if there's uncertainty about the revenue you get from your uh, system, the banks may not finance because they see that as risky. This is a key factor. So we're seeing um, for the last three years, we've seen lots of uh, projects fail on financing uh, because the, the uh, uh, output was unclear because the curtailment was unclear. Um, there have been some, some folks saying, well, it's not going to be that bad. And, and um, some leadership of, of some companies like Nomura Shoken had a, uh, a guideline of what they think would happen and some other companies follow. But now that curtailment is actually taking place. People are starting to take a second look at that. So um, system design, uh, let me talk briefly about system design in, in Japan. Um, in six years ago, I pushed for 1500 volts in the United States. Um, I had a round table where I invited all the industry players and I, I repeated the same thing here um, and moved um, I don't want to brag and say I moved the industry, but I was certainly one of the people that had an impact on uh, the technology when it got to promoting 1500 volts in this country. Um, there is now a 250 megawatt project being built. That is 250 megawatts because um, I pushed the company uh, to, do, to do so. Uh, the first two megawatts uh, that was installed was also after a long conversation with the CEO of that company. So the first two 1500 volt projects are now um, in, in uh, being installed and um, most of the pipeline of uh, some of the EPCs and developers is 1500 volts today. So there's a big switch to 1500 volts from 1000 volts. Uh, I think we don't need to belabor that too much. Um, there's a, um, because I think the audience understands, but if you have a question, uh, please do feel free to um, uh, uh, put a question into the, the chat box. So, um, a couple of points on the curve. The duck curve that you see here is actually from Southern California, Edison in, in, in California, the expected um, output in 2020, or this, sorry, the expected demand, whereas um, the existing demand in 2012 or 2013, when they made this graph was here, they said, well, if this continues with rooftop solar, we're gonna see demand shrink around noontime down to here. Uh, effectively, what happened was that uh, because of the high sunshine and the high permeation and the the uh, pro solar attitude of the Californians. Uh, 2017, we already saw California Edison or Southern California Edison uh, with demand, uh, demand curve below the 2020 line. Um, some of the uh, impacts that are similar, so, and, and we've seen some, some impacts on, on policy because of this. Uh, now there's um, uh, battery subsidies that uh, were pushed for, and uh, there's also a big move towards uh, batteries in this space. Um, and and what, what's parallel here, if we look at parallels, these, this curve we don't see yet in Japan, not yet. Um, maybe in, in parts of Okinawa. But in, um, in Hokkaido, we see that uh, batteries are not required. And um, uh, in Hokkaido and Okinawa, so all the way in the north and all the way in the southwest, uh, where there's uh, islands basically with small population. Kyushu, also a relatively small island, has started uh, curtailments last year and had a big one um, on the 13th of this month. Uh, and what we've also seen starting recently is a trade of energy between two, two utilities. Uh, they were monopolies in their own right.
Sorry, Martin. I don't know what's going on. There. You're kind of robotic now in your voice. Um, in this case, uh, what happens? You should explore them. Okay. And your image is, is frozen. So, um, okay. My voice is getting. Maybe actually, maybe if you switch Hello? off your, maybe if you switch off your camera, we might be able oh. to hear you better. Actually, it oh, must be a problem okay. with connection. Um. Better now. Can you internet access? We can hear you now, yes. Okay. If you have an internet cable at hand, mm -hmm. it might be a good idea to connect. Yes, oh, good. Can you see? Okay. Well. I told you, I'm on my own. Can you give me? I don't, it's. I can give you even if you find Yes, please. But that's when it's the same as yours. Okay. Well, it's. Un Martin, un maybe we yes. can, we can uh, go to uh, Kenji's presentation. Yes, please. To please have uh, Kenji. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, well, post your questions in the Q&A box, uh, you know, everyone in the uh, audience. And uh, Genji, uh, if you could uh, start your presentation, that would be appreciated. Yes, my pleasure. Uh, can I share my uh, display? Yes, please. Okay. Where is it? Okay, here it is. I hope it appears. Yes. Okay, allow me to start my presentation. And my presentation is about the car roof PV. Can you hear me, everyone? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. So that me, uh, car roof PV is uh, sometimes called vehicle integrated PV. So because of that, I'm a combiner of the IEC WG7, uh, the official I mean, term of the car roof PV will be vehicle integrated PV. But many of us uh, can say uh, car roof PV, so allow me uh, to use this word in my presentation. So what happens in the car roof PV? And uh, the situation around car roof PV has changed during these six months. Uh, maybe that started, I mean, two or three years ago uh, when that Ford, uh, Ford, uh, Ford Motor in the United States uh, displayed uh, their concept car uh, using solar energy as the uh, I mean, uh, main uh, energy of the EV. However, uh, most of the people did not believe if it is, uh, it will be real. And uh, two years ago, uh, Toyota Motors, I mean, uh, uh, started the sales of the solar Prius, the uh, hybrid car that partially powered by solar energy. Actually, uh, it rose 180 watts of the solar panel uh, made by Panasonic and uh, can run uh, their hybrid, I mean, vehicle up uh, in maximum of six kilometers per day uh, if the sunshine condition is good. And uh, Toyota Motor also made a presentation in the EU PV sec, and I think that this is a, a, a kind of a trigger uh, for the PV people to think it uh, seriously. And actually, yeah, this presentation was, I mean, uh, summarizing in the closing session. And at that moment, uh, Toyota Motor concluded high efficiency PV will make uh, almost 70% of the private car, uh, passengers' cars run ex exclusively by solar energy. So this means, what this means is that I mean, uh, the driver only fill the gasoline or gas uh, when I mean, uh, uh, he asked for their car on the inspection. 
And uh, uh, several months later, uh, IEA, International Energy Agency, has started uh, the new task of the PV for transport. And now, uh, several new car manufacturers announce EV with a big solar panel. And uh, uh, we are going to uh, talk it later. So uh, what I mean, uh, PV panel on the solar car does and that, uh, this is I a mean, uh, slide uh, made by Toyota Motors. Uh, Toyota Motors does not have EV right now. Uh, they promote I mean, hybrid cars. Uh, but uh, th their hybrid car is now plugging hybrid cars, uh, contains I mean, uh, uh, big I mean, uh, batteries, and uh, mainly uh, uh, drive by the battery, uh, charged by the customers. And uh, using the uh, solar power and expanding the uh, 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 solar panel and changing uh, the car design because of the, in principle, solar panel cannot be expanded and uh, they cannot cover the three dimensional curve. Then that to me, uh, 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 Toyota Motors think it is possible to uh, drive a car in average of 30 kilometer per day only by solar energy. And this is a scenario that the Toyota Motors think. But again, Toyota Motor is a big company and uh, there are many types of the people uh, working for uh, various kinds of the automobiles. And I have to say uh, that uh, people working for uh, me, a solar car is a kind of a minority. So please do not think this is an official announcement of the entire uh, Toyota Motors, especially uh, in, the view of the, in view of the car sales. But I mean, uh, uh, venture capitals are real, relatively, I mean, uh, very light and uh, moves very quickly and decisively. And uh, what, what I found is Sono Motors in Germany, uh, they recently announced uh, 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 solar car that ran 30 kilometers per, per day. Uh, the reason why you think is a past sentence is that now that they are concerning 30, uh, 30 kilometers per day is uh, too promising. And uh, they are now concerning about the uh, 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 deleting uh, this number. But in any way, uh, what is revolution in the solar motors is that I mean, uh, they think that the solar energy is the main energy of the automobiles. And uh, this is a kind of a revolution. And again, uh, uh, I like the design of solar motors. Although that I mean, it is a little bit I mean, uh, exotic, but I mean, uh, it is a kind of the uh, good car, not for the solar car for the race. And another I mean, venture is a light year uh, in Europe and uh, Hanaji in China. And uh, recently, Hanaji I mean, uh, owned the Mia Sole in the United States CIGS manufacturers. And uh, both of uh, these I mean, manufacturers use a CIGS uh, flexible uh, solar panel. So you know that I mean, uh, one of the uh, disadvantage of the uh, crystalline silicon solar cell is co uh, coverage of the curved surface. But the CIGS uh, can be flexible. And uh, although uh, the average efficiency may be lower than the crystalline silicon solar cell, uh, uh, they can uh, completely cover the entire uh, car roof. So the, so the output, uh, total output from the uh, uh, solar panel may be larger than that of the crystal and silicon solar cell. So this is why, uh, this is one of the reasons why at the uh, uh, recent I mean, uh, uh, solar car uh, chose CIGS rather than, rather than crystal and silicon solar cell. And another uh, advantage of a CIGS solar cell is a robustness to the partial shading. Uh, so different from the uh, uh, solar panel or in the utility market and or, or, or uh, the rooftop of the residential houses, uh, it is common uh, that the solar panel on the car roof is uh, often shaded by the buildings and uh, by some kind of obstacles around the road. So uh, uh, silicon solar cell uh, easily drop its output uh, by the mismatching loss, but CRGS is relatively robust in the shading problem. 
So this is one of the reasons. And uh, I mentioned that the Toyota uh, announced that the 70 percent of the car uh, can run exclusively by the solar energy. Actually, uh, this is uh, the detail, detailed um, calculation uh, can be found in the paper of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Masuda in Toyota Motors, uh, published by uh, Solar Energy in, in, in Elsevier. And uh, uh, recently, more recently, uh, NEDO, uh, Japanese, I mean, one of the uh, uh, independent uh, uh, research body, uh, governmental research body in Japan, uh, made some kind of research report or investigation report, uh, mainly uh, contributed by Mizuho uh, General Research uh, Institute, one of the uh, think tank, uh, economic think tank in Japan and uh, uh, consulting several experts, uh, solar resource and uh, uh, Toyota Nissan and uh, Sharp and other, I mean, researchers. And uh, they made a concise and very precise and intensive report uh, in about also six months ago. Unfortunately, uh, this, is, this has not been translated in English. So that, I mean, uh, it, it, it is necessary uh, to translate it in your, in your uh, mother language. But I mean, this report can be downloaded, can be downloaded by everyone. So that, I mean, I uh, strongly encourage uh, to try to, I mean, uh, download this report. And it is about uh, 20 or uh, 30 pages, but it has a lot of good and accurate inf uh, information. But uh, what is really certain, uh, both, I mean, Toyota and Nedo uh, reached to the same conclusion. Almost 70% of the car can run ex exclusively by solar energy. And another important, I mean, number is uh, the red, I mean, uh, circle. 3.23 uh, square meter. This is, I mean, designed, I mean, uh, required PV module, uh, uh, no, no, uh, PV panel area. Uh, actually, it is a projected area and required PV module extensive. So simply multiplication of these two numbers, it is almost one kilowatt. And please remember, this is a very important number. One kilowatt, three square meters, and 30%. So that the most of the important number of the car roof PV is related to three. Uh, another one is that 30% of the car may have to rely on the near fuel cell cars because it is too much. So three is a really important number. And uh, maybe uh, you, uh, you may have a chance to uh, examine uh, other I mean, numbers. For example, temperature loss coefficient, MPPT loss, and other I mean, electrical loss. And uh, these I mean, uh, calculation base was open uh, in the report. And uh, I think it is a kind of reasonable number. So this means, in case uh, we are able to uh, take 31% 30, uh, of the highest, really high efficiency solar panel, we can rely, uh, we can expect that the uh, most of the car can run by the solar energy. But I assume that most of you uh, uh, came from the uh, uh, PV people, and 31% of the module efficiency will be extremely challenging. But in any way, uh, let's consider about the potential market. Again, 30% is uh, three is an uh, I mean, uh, important number. So 70% of the car uh, can ride by the solar energy. And the annual sales of the passenger's car is something like that. And uh, 30 kilometer per day drive means one kilowatt. So simply uh, multiplication of the 70% of the annual car sales and one kilowatt, it will be 50 gigawatt per year. Uh, this is a kind of a surprise side, I mean, uh, uh, potential market. However, uh, 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 we have another I mean, figure of 500 gigawatt per year of the potential market. Uh, this calculation uh, came from the demand side. So that me, uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, the uh, accelerated reduction of the greenhouse gas emission, 
and uh, transportation people will have to uh, make great effort to reduce, I mean, uh, greenhouse gas emission from the uh, automobiles. So uh, this is a presentation in the uh, in the last, I mean, uh, EU PV sec uh, by uh, Dr. Breyer uh, in two months ago. So uh, he mentioned in 2050, 90.1 terawatt of the PV, this is accumulated number, accumulated installation, will be demanded for transportation to meet the goal of the greenhouse gas emission. Again, this is a demand side. And 75% uh, uh, of the energy in the transportation sec uh, sector uh, uh, comes from the uh, uh, automobiles. So simply multiplication of the 91.19.1 uh, terawatt and 75%, and we only uh, has have 30 years. So that I mean, uh, in order to achieve uh, this 90.1 terawatts of the accumulating installation, it is uh, it is I mean expected that we install 500 gigawatt, gigawatt per year of the PV installation for the car. Maybe uh, this is maybe the installation of the PV on the car roof or uh, uh, additional PV in the utility or uh, independent PV uh, for the EV charging station. But again, uh, grid in Japan uh, complains about the PV, and that, I think that um, uh, the same uh, situation can be seen in the world. So, uh, in any way, maybe very likely outside the grid, we have to uh, find uh, the significant uh, installation of the PV uh, for the effective reduction of the greenhouse gas in the transportation sec uh, sector, especially in the car. So uh, concerning these two numbers, supply side and demand side, I think uh, 50 gigawatt per year would be uh, the good, I mean, uh, potential market of the I mean, uh, car roof PV. But again, uh, car roof PV is not the extension of the solar panel. We need various, I mean, uh, research and development. So 50 gigawatt per year market will be created tomorrow. Obviously the answer is no, it is impossible right now uh, uh, using the current time technology. So bright future of the car roof PV is not the extension of the current technology. So what we should do? For example, uh, let's think about the uh, uh, solar cell efficiency. So some scientists uh, I mean, uh, talks about the solar cell efficiency with a very uh, bright future. Uh, but others, I mean, uh, people uh, in the uh, 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 manufacturer may think about I any mean, uh, uh, conservative numbers. So uh, this I mean, uh, estimation varies among the type of the PV. Uh, generally speaking, the emerging PV uh, would like to show uh, the better or happy, happier number. But I mean, it is important that we compare uh, to examine these numbers by the same scale. Or we have to think about the practical efficiency limit, not I mean, uh, uh, shock rate Kaiser limit or some kind of the uh, thermodynamic limit, but we, what we need is a practical number. So uh, what we did is to interview to the experts of these materials. And actually the interviewer, interviewer is, uh, is not, was Professor Yamaguchi, uh, my boss. I've not had any, uh, sufficient power uh, to discuss uh, with these people, but my boss has something like a very strong I mean, power in the research and development. And he finally succeeded uh, to generate this table. But in any way, uh, this table contains a potential number. Potential means a potential and practical number. And uh, also another column is a, uh, achieved number. Uh, the best time in solar cell that was confirmed by the third body. So in, uh, there are several uh, arguments 
one, uh, the, the, the first argument is uh, crystal silico solar cell and CIGS, and even perovskite, 31% of the mean, uh, module efficiency is impossible. And another thing is that uh, thanks to the effort of the uh, uh, solar cell engineers and researchers, most of the solar cells has reached to almost 90% of the practical efficiency limit. So what we can do is to expect 3-5 multi-junction solar cell. But you know that the 3-5 multi-junction solar cell is mainly used for the uh, space. And actually, uh, uh, there are several I mean, uh, research results, and uh, several research uh, shows some kind of a really uh, impressive number. But I mean, still, uh, we need some kind of confirmation. And uh, my position is to expect three, five people to show, to accelerate some kind of research and development, to show some kind of the, uh, uh, better and acceptable milestone uh, for the cost down. And another approach may be the static concentrator. So 2x and 3x of the small, uh, low concentration and uh, uh, save the, uh, the area of the solar cell. This is another issue. But in any way, uh, concerning about the uh, current achievable real estate on the car roof and then the uh, food, 30% uh, is a kind of the goal. When we expect a uh, car uh, exclusively uh, run by the solar energy, this is the first time challenge. So this kind of a solar panel is a range extender. Simply uh, extend the range of the uh, car. For example, one kilometer per day or two kilometer per day. They still need some kind of uh, EV ch charging station or gasoline if it is a hybrid. Another important challenge is that I mean, uh, we are going to expect 70% or majority of the I mean, uh, EV or uh, plug-in hybrid will install the solar energy. However, uh, the PV is not very beautiful. And actually, uh, when I uh, talk about the uh, uh, architects, uh, most of the architects uh, mention that the solar panel is ugly. I think it is true. And the uh, car uh, is sold uh, by a uh, very close distance, maybe at 20 centimeter or 30 centimeter uh, to the solar panel. And uh, most of the uh, customer uh, complain about the appearance of the solar panel. And if there is some kind of small defect, this car will not be sold. So that the car dealer will complain to the car manufacturer. So appearance is extremely important. However, uh, this area we have uh, many I mean, good challenge and many good I mean, improvement. So this is a, a recent I mean, uh, study done by the Jamaica University and uh, Toyota Motors they try to I mean, uh, uh, imitate uh, the car paint uh, onto the I mean, CIG solar cell. So you know that the I mean, uh, car paint uh, generate almost 1,000 new colors in every year. So that I mean, uh, we need a, a precise and very I mean, vivid and a, a very sensitive uh, color control onto the solar cell. So, However, so you may understand, uh, you may imagine uh, painting onto the I mean, uh, so, uh, solar cell reduces the uh, power output. Yes, you're right. But I mean, uh, if you use carefully examine uh, by the filler of the paint, for, for example, grass filler or mica filler, uh, this I mean, uh, reduction of the power output may be 10% or 15%. And this kind of te technology is now progressed, I mean, uh, very rapidly. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I have seen uh, blue and yellow. Uh, this blue and yellow is really, I mean, nice color. And another challenge is curvature of the, uh, no, no, uh, coverage of the curvature. As I mentioned before, uh, Toyota Solar Plus uh, has uh, 180 watts. The reason why they cannot load more than 180 watts is the issue of the curvature. So you may find some kind of the yellow circle on the uh, solar car produce. This is the area 
that was not used for the coverage of the I mean, silicon solar cell because silicon solar cell is very rigid and very easy break. So they cannot cover the I mean, uh, three dimensional cover. If they use I mean, thin uh, silicon solar cell, they may cover the uh, cylindrical surface. But it is extremely difficult to the uh, spherical surface, what we call three dimensional surface. And the coverage of three dimensional surface requires expansion of the crystal. And uh, CIGS has a better situation, but still uh, CIGS cannot cover uh, three-dimensional uh, 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 surface. So they need some kind of uh, uh, challenge using some kind of flexible or expandable uh, substrate onto the CIGS film. And uh, there are two ways. One is to uh, change the design. So this is I mean, uh, uh, recent I mean, design uh, uh, issued by uh, Hanaji in China. I think that this is also a good design. And uh, this, I mean, uh, try to uh, escape from the three dimensional curves of curved roof. And another challenge is to uh, develop expandable uh, solar cell using uh, the wearable device technology. And uh, this is a uh, uh, recent, I mean, uh, example uh, developed by uh, uh, Nagaoka University of Technology, they use, I mean, wearable device technology, and they, they use also static concentrator. So that, I mean, a uh, small solar cell is, I mean, placed, and uh, this has uh, some kind of the uh, space uh, among the solar cell, and that space can be used to adjust uh, the curvature. And they use, only, uh, they also add some kind of static concentrator uh, to cover uh, uh, the gap uh, among the solar cell. So this is another possibility. But in any way, we may have uh, a variety of the technologies uh, that can make real of the three-dimensional uh, coverage of the surface. But again, it is still research and development. So what should we do? And uh, I was, uh, uh, because of the six months of dr a dramatic change around the I mean, curve PV, I was often asked by uh, uh, PV people how uh, uh, his company uh, would think about the uh, car roof PV. I always answer, we have two scenarios. One is a solar car scenarios, and the second is a range extender scenarios. And depending on the uh, policy of the company, uh, I encourage them to choose either one, of the, uh, either one of them. So solar car scenario is really simple. Uh, simply targeting the 50 gigawatts per year of the market. Uh, so this means that 70% of the car running and 50% uh, uh, of the car means that the car uh, runs 30 kilometers per day ex exclusively by so, uh, solar car. However, as I mentioned me before, uh, we have uh, overcome three technolog technological challenges. One is the uh, affordable. 3-5 multi-junction solar cells, possibly using the HVP and the sub substrate recycle technology. And the second is a color control, like automobile uh, body color. And third was a coverage to 3D curve surface. And this is a scenario that was uh, discussed in IEA PVPS task 17. And another practical scenario is a range extender scenario. Market sites, I don't know. Frankly speaking, I don't know. Maybe uh, it rely on the incentive policies uh, in uh, local area. For example, China, for example, in Japan, for example, Germany may have a different, I mean, uh, I expect different, I mean, incentive policies. So that the I mean, incentive policy uh, will define the market site. But the advantage of this uh, 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 strategy is very clear. The technology is here. We have a technology. The market may grow without technological breakthrough, but taken over the survivor by the solar car scenario. So in the long run, if the uh, PV uh, manufacturers survived in the solar car scenario, uh, get into the market, maybe uh, these I mean, uh, companies will be 
beaten uh, by the Soraka people. Uh, because of the, uh, the drivers uh, always I mean, uh, try to take high efficiency and flexible and vivid color. However, uh, it may be an attractive market for the buses and trucks. Uh, because of the buses, trucks uh, should be always range extender. And uh, we, uh, they do not have to worry, uh, worry about the solar car scenario. And the real estate of the bus and truck, trucks uh, is really flat, and uh, they do not care about the appearance very much. So in this sense, uh, these I mean, solar panel may be the extension of the current technology. We do not expect any I mean, breakthrough. And uh, this may use a Christian silicon module. Uh, that is not suitable for the curve coverage. But uh, uh, again, uh, uh, the real estate is a flat and the silicon solar cell is a good candidate. And I'm now expecting uh, uh, the revolution around the I mean, range extender scenario may happen or may occur in China. So you know that I mean, two thirds of the uh, solar panel is made by China and most of them is a Christian silicon solar cell and more than half of the EV is now uh, produced, manufactured and used in China. And the grid condition of the China uh, relied on the coal and uh, is not I mean, very robust to the uh, very uh, I mean, uh, massive input of the uh, uh, PV energy may require a solar panel as a range extender. I think that it is a better I mean, uh, policy rather than uh, is, uh, preparing a massive infrastructure of the I mean, EV charging station. So, uh, let's do research and development together. We have a um, bright future. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Araki. I was just about to say that, you know, we were running out of time, but thank you thank for you your, your presentation. It's been very, very insightful, very interesting. So, um, you know, one quick question, actually, how long do you think this uh, research and development will take before um, we can actually see um, an elect uh, a solar car that can run for 30 kilometers a day uh, on solar only? Okay, first of all, uh, let me say, uh, in the range extender scenario, uh, several uh, I mean, PV manufacturer has started uh, the shipment of the I mean, car roof PV. And uh, for solar car scenario, uh, I think uh, uh, it will take 15 years, one, five years. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. And um, we also had a, another question, which I think is uh, for Martin uh, Mesmer. So Martin, if you're there. Um, so someone in the um, asked through the Q&A box um, whether hydrogen has been considered as a, a fuel for vehicles. Okay, good question. So uh, my answer is really positive. So you know that I mean, Toyota is promoting hydrogen fuel cell, but so you know that 30% of the car should rely on the hydrogen. And that uh, if we are really serious about the 50 gigawatts, uh, no, no, 500 gigawatts or 50 gigawatts per year of the uh, uh, solar installation every year, we have to uh, uh, prepare for some kind of infrastructure to absorb uh, the seasonal variation of, of the solar energy output. And hydrogen is a really good way. So combination of the hydrogen and the car roof PV will be a, a really good combination. And we stand, I mean, in parallel. Mm -hmm. So this would uh, counter the issue that uh, Martin presented before that was about uh, curtailment, right? So you wouldn't have to curtail the PV power, but you use it to generate hydrogen. Would you say that's possible? We can't hear. Oh, is, is, is this my question? Yes. So I okay, want okay. to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
So uh, we have to think about two issues. One, uh, we definitely need electrolyzer. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, we do not have, I mean, uh, many electrolyzer in Japan, different from Europe. Mm. This is the most, I mean, important issue. And the second, research and development of the hydrogen generation is mainly uh, done by uh, uh, artificial, uh, uh, artificial light synthetics in Japan. And uh, my personal opinion is uh, really negative uh, to this technology. We definitely need, I mean, high volume and, and uh, uh, effective uh, electrolyzer. But it is not common. Uh, it is not common. It is not popular at all. Uh, this is, I mean, second barrier. Right. So there's one more comment on that, if I may. Yes. And that is um, the, the, the energy, the round trip efficiency is rather low. And therefore, the question came up is, well, what if, if it's excess energy that I have, it's throwaway energy anyway. Can't I use that? Um, the, the, the throwaway energy that we get from PV is usually at noon in the summer and it's not in the winter and, and at night. Or um, it's, it's very short period of the, of the year. Therefore, the proposition is also tough. It's a, it's a tough financial proposition to use only that little energy for that, or use a hydrogen storage system for that small part of the year. Maybe, um, you know, this is a, a question that um, I was just thinking, thinking out loud. Could you, um, if you bring also uh, wind power that could be curtailed, you know, that would be another possibility, right? Given the amount of uh, energy that, that, that Denmark is currently seeing from wind uh, and the amount of excess that they might have. Same answer. Okay, so Martin, I'm afraid we've lost you again. Um, really sorry. So um, I think uh, if I can uh, summarize, it sounds like if you have a large amount of both wind and solar power that would have to be curtailed, then it might be possible to uh, harness this energy using an, an electrolyzer and, uh, to create uh, hydrogen. I know there is a project in, in Germany now to do just this, to... Uh, to do just uh, in, um, and then they they want to use also uh, CO two to actually generate um, to generate uh, the uh, other syn synthetic gas to uh, create other types of chemicals. You know that could be uh, used uh, as fuel or in uh, in other chemical applications. But uh, um, right, so. Um, um, you know, I um, I think that like all um, all good things, you know, um, this webinar also has to come to an end. So um, I uh, uh, you know have to thank uh, both presenters Kenji Araki from uh, Toyota Technology Institute and Martin Mesmer um, for the uh, participation. And uh, well, um, I think. Um, you know, all of you know, if you have been to one of our webinars before that, you will get the webinar recording and presentations uh, in a few days time, probably early next week. Um, you'll be able to see, um, you know, the um, all of the, the recording and uh, uh, the recordings there and get the contact details from uh, the presenters if you have any uh, any questions. So thank you to everyone uh, in the audience who's been uh, with us today and um, hopefully see you again soon in our next webinars. So check our website um, at uh, insights.com. You'll see our coming webinars there. Thank you very much. Have a good day.